to join us today. Thank you, commissioners, for being here. Um, the first item on our agenda this evening is the adoption of the agenda, and we have a revised agenda that's been given to us at our desks. Um, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Great. The next item is the approval of the August 23rd, 2018 minutes that we received by mail. Do I have a motion to approve? Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. Uh, the f next item is is the recognition of council members, and I know we have a few Glover. here. Um, Councilman Glover, would you like to come up? Thank you. We'll sort of take you in order as we see you, and if you would like to come up with your item, you can let me know. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you again for allowing me to come up and, and speak with you. Thank you very much. Councilman Mendez? Council Lady Murphy, are you coming up now, or are you going to wait? I'm coming up now. Okay. We're checking, we're checking Kept, the Right. We good? Yes. Although I'm sure no one has ever had a problem hearing me project and things like that. So um, I am here to speak on behalf of my neighbors and constituents on, um, let me find the case number. It is... It's a subdivision um, that was deferred last meeting to this meeting because it was a tied vote, um, and so it's back before y'all. I think it's number 11, somewhere around there. So it's the Pennington 3700 uh, Woodlawn. Item six. Item six, my bad. Numbers are rough. Um, so I wanted to start with kind of quoting your subdivision regulations. Um, the first sentence says, these regulate, well, this is part of the Tennessee Code annotated. These regulations are intended to provide for the harmonious development of a municipality 
so on and so forth. So I know that last meeting, kind of our harmonious concept has been somewhat tossed aside because of the assumption that this meets the subdivision regulations. But I would like to continue to argue and bring to your attention that I think the neighbors have demonstrated, and I think that y'all in uh, May demonstrated that this type of subdivision is not harmonious with the surrounding yeah, um, the community plan or, or woodlawn, the block face, and, and so on. So again, the, the community plan of Nashville Next is a T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance policy here. And I think what is important to note is that the policy even states that it will experience some change over time, primarily when buildings are expanded or replaced. It doesn't mention that the change that will happen over time is major changes to the development pattern um, or to drastic lot size changes or, or roads being created and things like that. The experience change over time that, it's, that this community policy speaks to is about buildings being replaced um, or expanded. And so when this occurs, efforts should be made to maintain the and retain the existing character of the neighborhood. So again, that policy speaks, um, I think is inconsistent with, with the proposal before you for basically the, I, I guess I'd call it the second and a half time because the first time was a little bit of a different plan, but it's basically the same plan in front of you for the second and a half time. So I won't go too far into that, but I wanted to remind y'all that how many neighbors came when we were over on Trinity Lane, how many neighbors were here um, two weeks ago. And I will tell you, there was a little bit of a miscommunication, and I talked to staff today. Uh, we were under the impression, and this could be my fault, um, that when the public hearing is closed, that we cannot continue to send emails and letters. We thought that kind of just cut off debate and comment from the community. And so that's why you did not see a renewed effort or renewed emails this time um, to, to help impress upon you our feelings and, and arguments for this case. So because of that, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, got a little extra to say tonight than I had normally planned. Um, so remember last time this was deferred because it was a tied vote. Um, let's get into the plan details. In the staff report, I quote directly, all lots will, would be accessed from a new public street that would generally align with the existing Lindbrook, Lindbrook Road. So one quick email that I sent over to Metro Council Legal this afternoon is, and, and y'all's legal might be able to answer this, is when new roads are created like this, will they then go through the legislative council process to be accepted the way that um, they are abandoned or, and I, I guess if you can't speak now, that's fine. Maybe we can answer it later. Um, my concern is, is this is a new, approving a new road that may or may not be a legislative function at some point because just like when we abandon easements and abandon roads or private roads are turned over into public, that typically goes through the legislative process. And so that's a question that I haven't gotten, a f council, our council didn't have a full answer for me today. Um, so the analysis in the staff report for the community character only analyzes lot four as an infill subdivision lot and ignores lot one, two, and three as if they are not subject to any subdivision regulations outside of the base, uh, base zoning square footage requirements. The new public road essentially creates a new block face that all lots should be compared to, um, compared to each other that are going to be a part of this new block face. Um, to m see if they meet the subdivision regulations, lot compatibility, or the infill subdivision regulations, meaning that lot one, two, three, and four, and one might argue that the adjacent parcel um, that is left out of this concept plan that was in the concept plan in May that you turned down should probably be part of that calculation as well, since all five of those parcels will have some sort of road frontage um, of this new of this new road. And so where where we are not, the staff is not applying that analysis to the three new lots at the top of this cul-de-sac close, um, I think that that should not be the case. I think that we should be, if we are creating a new block face, they should be analyzed the same way that other infill blocks and lots are being analyzed. 
Um, I think this is also, that argument is especially supported by the condition in the staff report that lot five, the only one that is being analyzed for infill development, um, it says that it's to be oriented to Woodlawn Drive, but the access will be limited to that new road. So again, if the access is limited to that new road, again, creating that new block face, I think that we should be considering the lot compatibility of the three back lots with the overall new block face that's being created. So by not analyzing lot one, two, and three with our subdivision infill regulations, as we are doing with one of the one of the lots here, lot four, we are piecemealing the considerations of the zoning and subdivision regulations, which can be detrimental to the public safety at the street location and welfare of other properties' views and potential value. The staff, uh, your staff recommendation and analysis even concedes that this proposal introduces a new street that changes the configurations of the lots and may alter the character along this block. And I will argue to you once again, as you've heard me three or four times and many of my neighbors say, this is changing the essential character of this block. So to address a little bit of public safety, um, as I mentioned, this new public road creates essentially two uh, curb cuts, it's a little hard to tell from, from the plats, the handouts that I have, or one large curb cut where it's already dangerous for Lynbrook across the street to exit and enter on Woodmont or Woodlawn Boulevard based on some of the topographical dips and ebbs and flow of the road. While this concept plan does not allow access to Woodlawn Drive for Lot 4, as I mentioned, how do we know that the adjacent parcel that was in the previously disapproved plan that is left out of this one, will not have a driveway onto Woodlawn Drive, creating an additional dangerous curb cut that would be too close to this new public road. And that being said, then the, the, the concession that could be made is that that lot that is being left out of the plan before you would have a curb cut in their driveway onto this new public road, yet again, murky and, and kind of messing, muddying the waters of why are we not analyzing all of these lots together on this new road. I wanted to touch on the fire marshal recommendations. On the plan that y'all disapproved in May, it said, now that one had a little different, it had a different road than this road now. So in that staff report, the fire marshal recommendation was to approve with conditions and that the fire code issues will be addressed in the permitting phase. As you all know, that's pretty standard. But it does say that the engineer has verified the radius for turns for fire department access. This staff report um, simply says, fire code issues will be addressed in the permitting phase. My concern is that this newly proposed public road um, has a, it's a, basically a P-shaped and it's a pretty tight one that I don't know and is not documented in this staff report and maybe there's other reports that I could have requested before this afternoon as I was writing my notes um, that showed that there is an appropriate radius. But it, 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 I find it interesting that it was mentioned in the first staff report where y'all disapproved it and, and that radius is not addressed here. And I have concerns about whether you could get a ladder truck, a pumper truck through there. As y'all know, I've represented firefighters for the past 11 years in my professional life and been on those tracks and they're pretty big and, and hard to maneuver, although those firefighters do a great job at it. So a few other things that I wanted to point out to y'all tonight on this proposed subdivision. A zoning ordinance or subdivision regulations cannot provide for all conceivable situations to which it must apply. And I think that's a given, and I think it's something that your director and I have spoken about this week of things that may need to be changed in the future. Again, working for 11 years on legislation at the state level, I know that every time a law is passed, we immediately have to start thinking through how does it apply in real life, do we need to change it, what are the unintended consequences, and that is why we have living documents for our legal system. So the provisions made must be to temper the strict application of the ordinance and yet achieve the purposes of the various development policies cited within the comprehensive plan in Nashville Next, which our ordinances direct you to. Um, again, going towards my argument that the neighbors and I do not feel this is harmonious or fits the general plan of Nashville Next and the neighborhood maintenance policy. 
Neighbors and this commission, as y'all did in May, have con concluded that this is not harmonious with the surrounding area or the National Next General Plan. By allowing the subdivision, if y'all choose to allow it, you are promoting investment and making more permanent development patterns that are inappropriate in locations such as this mid-block parcel on Woodlawn. And that could have a detrimental effect, not just in my district, but in districts across Davidson County. Disapproving this proposal does not substantially deprive the use of this property or other subdivision op options of the property. This property has other suitable uses and options for division that would still meet the zoning code ordinances and provide a reasonable rate of return. My neighbors and I have voiced to you that approving this subdivision proposal would effectively weaken or nullify the intent and purposes of Nashville Next and our policies in the area. Commissioner Fabian Bendy, who unfortunately is not here tonight, at the last meeting proposed that rather than creating a private drive dividing up this block, that this parcel could be divided into two or three lots, um, I, don't know, I guess vertical to Woodlawn, and those lots would face Woodlawn. This option is a marketable option and would still provide a very reasonable rate of return for the property owners. It's actually a proposal that the neighbors and I had discussed previously to last meeting, and we've discussed since your last meeting. And they would be favorable to the lots being divided in this manner, or combining the, the adjacent parcel owned by this estate and redividing in such a manner to have kind of longer, narrow lots rather than creating the expense and the future upkeep of Metro taxpayers of a public street. Now, that may require a variance from your subdivision regulations um, to, to make that subdivision appropriate. But I think I've voiced to y'all, and I think that my neighbors have as well, over the past two meetings and in multiple emails, that that is something that would be much more harmonious with the neighbors, personally, and residentially in their property. Uh, this option and potential variance, if y'all so see appropriate would be much more appropriate for you to approve because this is a unique and oddly shaped lot and boundaries of the parcel. It would also better meet the statutory rep uh, requirements for harmonious development when granted a variance if needed. While it still alters the character of the block face, it is much closer development pattern than what is currently being proposed to you today. And I think the neighbors and I feel like if this lot is going to subdivide, that we should sub, it should be subdivided in a manner that is in the character and keeping of that harmonious pattern and the established development pattern on Woodlawn, rather than breaking it up mid-block in a way that is not truly appropriate for the development. So tonight I ask you to disapprove the subdivision proposal because lots one, two, and three should be compared for street frontage and other requirements because this is a new public road being proposed, thus creating a new block face, but it already has existing lots that would be on that new road. Also, the new public road is dangerous for the driving conditions on Woodlawn. Um, and the potential curb cut that could come with this, the separate adjacent lot being developed separately. There's no guarantee of where that curb cut is going to come from or go. Overall, this proposal is not harmonious with the surrounding character and is not in line with the Nashville Next general plan. And I think based on the public safety issue, the effect to the other property, the fact that there is a way to subdivide this in a way that is harmonious to the neighbors and harmonious to the character of the neighborhood, I respectfully ask y'all to disapprove it tonight. And I'm happy to stick around for questions if that's appropriate. I know the public hearing is closed. Okay. Thank you very much. So because there was a specific question posed to staff, I do think um, about whether council accepts the new road. Lisa or Bob, if y'all could clarify what that process is. Sure. So um, new roads uh, with any subdivision are dedicated by plat. 
um, which is recorded at the Registered Deeds Office. Um, once they are built and accepted by Metro Public Works, then they're added to the uh, official street map, and the official street map is readopted by council yearly. And so with that adoption, they are adopting the acceptance of any streets that have been built and accepted within new subdivisions. Thank you. Councilman Davis. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, I want to thank you for volunteering your time and your and being good public servants to our city. I want to thank the um, planning staff for their commitment and long hours. And even though we we appreciate you greatly for the hard work and the hours that you put in. I'm here um, for just one bill, and it is, um, it is um, 064. Um, last week, I mean, a couple weeks ago, last planning commission meeting, we I asked for a deferral, and so did the um, owner, because we were very close in working out a, I wouldn't call it a deal, but a solution. Um, a lot of work goes in from the staff on the homeowners end and on the council end because we don't like bringing bills that are disapproved to the commissioners. We like to be arm in arm, arm in arm and on the same page with the staff and definitely with the commissioners. And there's a solution here and it is on the consent agenda. So I just want to thank Sean and all of the staff members there for their hard work. And I know that the um, director always hears the bad reports. Well, I like to give them the good reports also. So I just want to thank the staff for the hard work. Sean did an excellent job working everything out. And I really appreciate your staff's hard work. Thank you. Anybody else? Have we missed anybody? Any council members? Okay. I think we are on to item E, which is the items for deferral and withdrawal. Okay, we have the following items for deferral or withdrawal. Item 1A, 2018 CP 006001 on page five of your agenda, a Bellevue Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to withdraw. Item number 1B, the associated case, 2018 SP 043001, the Security Central Storage SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 25th Planning Commission meeting. Item number two, 2018Z005TX001, a request for a text amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 11th Planning Commission meeting. Item number three, 2018SP035001, the Elm Hill Place sub, uh, Elm Hill Place SP. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number five. On page six of your agenda, 2018S110001, the Snyder One Lot Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 8th Planning Commission meeting. Item number seven, 2005UD005006, the Bedford Hotel. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 27th Planning Commission meeting. And I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number eight, 2018Z038 PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number nine, 2018Z039 PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 12 on page seven of your agenda, 2018Z073 PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to September 27th meeting. Item number 15A on page eight of your agenda, 2018 SP 049001, 3115 Murphy Road SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 27th Planning Commission meeting. And I will note that uh, Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item 15B, 2001P005001, the associated case. It's a PUD cancellation. Staff recommendation is to defer to the September 27th Planning Commission meeting. And Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. 
Item number 17, 2018-S-149-001 on page 9 of your agenda. The G, G Company's Investment Subdivision staff recommendation is to defer to the September 27th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 19, 2018-S-155-001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 25th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 22 on page 10 of your agenda, 2018-Z-087-PR-001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 11th Planning Commission meeting. Great, thank you very much. Um, so just to quickly recap the items for deferral withdrawal, items 1A, 1B, item 2, item 3, item 5, item 7, item 8, 9, 12, 15A and 15B, 17, 19, and 22. That's correct. Okay. I also need to recuse myself from item 7. Okay. Commissioner Haynes recused on item 7. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the items? And a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next item that we have is the consent agenda. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent. Um, item number 10 on page 7 of your agenda, 2018-Z-064-PR-001, a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located at 114 Lucille Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 11, 2018-Z-072-PR-001, a request to rezone from RS5 to MULA zoning on properties located on Clifton Avenue and 27th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 13A, 2018-CP-002-001, a request to amend the Parkwood Union Hill Community Plan by changing from T3 Neighborhood Evolving to T3 Community Center for properties located on West Cap Road, Hickory Hills Boulevard, and West Cap Road and Hickory Hills Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 13B, the associated case on page 8 of your agenda, 2018 SP 064001, a request to rezone from R15 to SP zoning on property located on West Cap Road to permit up to 50,000 square feet of self-service storage. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions if the associated plan amendment is approved and to disapprove if the associated plan amendment is not approved. Item number 14, 2018 SP 004001, a request to rezone from AR2A to SP zoning on properties located on Pinhook Road to permit 41 single family lots. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 18 on page 9 of your agenda, 2018-S-151-001. It's a request for a concept plan approval to create 37 lots on properties located on South New Hope Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 20. 2002-UD-001-010, it's a Green Hills UDO sign modification to modify, um, sorry, request for modification to the Green Hills UDO sign standards to allow for a wall sign in excess of 100 square feet at the Green Hills Mall. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 21 on page 10 of your agenda, 2018-Z-070-PR-001. It's a request to rezone from IWD to MULA for properties located on Baptist World Center Drive and Spurgeon Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. And under other business, item 26, to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. 
Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so commissioners, just to recap the consent agenda items again, items 10, 11, 13A and 13B, 14, 18, 20, 21, and 26. Correct. Okay. And I just want to note that I'm recused from 20. From 20. Okay, thank oh, you. I had that noted. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> thank you for the clarification. Commissioner, do I have a vote for motion for approval? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Well, we are on to item number four. And just for the public, we will be hearing tonight items four, six, 16A, and 16B. Item number four is a request to rezone from AR2A to SP zoning on 10 acres located at 6280 North New Hope Road to permit 55 single family lots. The site is located um, south of Old Lebanon Dirt Road um, on the west side of North New Hope Road between an existing family subdivision over here and North New Hope Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. You should have received a memo correcting a clerical error on two of the proposed conditions. Please note that the corrected conditions are typographical corrections only and that no changes to the plans have been made. The, here's a view of the site looking north. Uh, the site is approximately 10 acres and contains a residential structure and accessory structure, which are not proposed to be uh, retained with this development. The character of the surrounding area includes um, a mix of larger residential pro properties and already developed single family subdivisions, uh, including the Chesney Glen subdivision located immediately west of the site here. The site is zoned, currently zoned AR2A and is generally located within a larger area of resident, residentially zoned properties, including RS15, um, with more intense residential zoning located to the south and east, uh, closer to Old Hickory Boulevard. There's also some AR2A zoning north of Old Lebanon um, Dirt Road. The proposed SP uh, is consistent with the existing T3 neighborhood evolving policy with, uh, and with the surrounding development pattern, which includes traditional suburban subdivisions and low intensity residential development. North New Hope Road is also identified as a collector avenue where additional density may be appropriate. The site plan proposes 55 single family lots. The northern half of the site includes 33 lots with a minimum lot size of 2,300 square feet, and the southern half of the site includes 22 lots in the 5,000 square foot range. Uh, just to orient you, here is uh, North New Hope coming down the east, eastern property line. Their larger fronts, the larger lots front a new public street, um, and a majority of the smaller lots are oriented around common open space, including two larger central courtyards uh, between the lots, the, the lots on the northern half of the site and North New Hope Road. Um, for reference, here is the uh, Chesney Glen subdivision. Vehicular access um, includes two public roads um, and several shared drives. Glentry Drive, an existing public street included in Chesney Glen over here, um, will be extended through the site and connect to North New Hope Road. Uh, a new public north-south road will extend from Glentree Drive to the southern property line to access the larger lots and also to provide options for um, connectivity to the south. A private north-south drive will extend from Glentree Drive to the, the northern portion of the site and connect to new, North New Hope Road. Um, there are also several east-west shared uh, private drives in here, but these private drives will not connect to North New Hope, which minimizes um, some curb cuts onto North New Hope Road. So Glentree Drive, 
located here and the new private drive are the only two access points onto North New Hope Road. Uh, this is a zoomed in um, view of the site and near the northern property line. And here again is the Chesney Glen subdivision. Um, most of the smaller lots are oriented away from Chesney Glen with adequate separation between the two developments. Um, lots one through five up here are um, oriented towards the northern property line with proposed lot five, which is highlighted in yellow. Um, located much closer to Chesney Glen than the other proposed lots. The rear of lot five will generally align with the front of an existing lot in Chesney Glen, creating a back to front relationship between the developments. Although landscaping is proposed west of lot five, um, in this area here. There is limited space between lot five and the western property line for a sufficient buffer and an internal sidewalk connection. As a result, no interior sidewalk connection is proposed within this space to the front of lots one through five. Sidewalks are shown uh, in black here, and um, you can see that the sidewalks are proposed to connect from the front of lots one through five to North New Hope Road only, meaning um, to access the front of these lots you would have to exit the site, walk along North New Hope Road, and then circle back in um, to access the front of these lots. Therefore, staff recommends that Lot 5 be removed from the plan and converted to open space to allow sufficient separation between the two subdivisions and to permit the sidewalk to extend to the south, wrapping back into the site rather than terminating at Lot 5. Open space is incorporated throughout the site, including two larger courtyards um, on the northern half of the site here, located along North New Hope, um, as well as some passive open space near the southern property line. The courtyards are located central to the smaller lots along uh, New Hope and can be accessed through the internal sidewalk network or directly from North New Hope Road. The southern open space, which includes existing vegetation down here, um, includes the vegetation which is indicated to be preserved at the bottom half of the uh, southeast corner of the site. Open space has also been identified along the northern and western property lines. Um, northern and western property lines. Staff recommends additional landscaping blee included along the western property line along the drive where the surface um, parking spaces are located to minimize any impacts um, from vehicle parking to the Ch Chesney Glen subdivision. The SP is consistent with the site's land use policies and surrounding neighborhood contexts. The plan proposes varying lot sizes and configurations, creating range of housing choices for future residents. The development includes lots that are grouped together around common open space, creating areas for active or passive recreation. Therefore, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Thank you very much. We'll open the item for public hearing. Is the uh, applicant here? Yes. You'll have 10 minutes. We can start with your name and address. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Adam Sager. I'm with Dale and Associates at 516 Heather Place. We're the civil engineer on the project. Um, I'd like to start out with a quick background of the property. And uh, it's okay if you guys don't want to start that yet. <laughs> I'd like to start out with just a quick background on the property. I know there's there's some neighbors here tonight. I've spoken with some neighbors uh, in opposition. I've spoken with neighbors in favor of it. And um, I know that there was, you know, a lot of people saying a lot of things. And I just want to go through the background of this property and the project and the process that we have gone through to get to this point. Uh, it's my understanding that for the past several years, other developers, not our group, but other developers have looked at this property and the councilman uh, had denied developing the property at that time. Uh, I even heard one that uh, one of the, the layouts had proposed like 100 lots on here, something like that. The councilman said no. And so we knew very early on that we wanted to take the right approach to this property. We approached the councilman and let him know that we were interested. And like he mentioned earlier, we met with some of the adjacent neighbors who were gonna be most affected. So we started very close to the property and then to work our way out and so we first met back in March um, with a handful of the neighbors and they gave us input. We had no layout at that time. They gave us input on what they'd like to see, connections, product types, things like that. We then went back 
started sketching on some layouts. We came back in April, met with them, solicited more impact or uh, input, bounced it off of them, and, and moved forward from there. Uh, knowing that this was going to be a very careful process, the owner has engaged multiple people, um, us as a civil engineer, Smith G Studios for architectural, uh, Greg Gamble for landscaping, land management group, uh, marketing research, and so a lot of thought has gone into this. This isn't something that was just slapped together. Uh, it's a very carefully planned neighborhood. Um, we we uh, initially submitted in June. We've worked carefully with staff. Uh, went back and forth with them. We've already deferred this project one time at Planning Commission to, again, work more with staff and make sure that we're all on the same page, that we're presenting the best project possible. Uh, we held a community meeting on September 4th. We did start to schedule a community meeting through council. I emailed Rosie and said, hey, we're going to be meeting with the neighbors on this. And shortly after that process started, I got uh, contacted by Sydney with the Homeowners Association. She said, yeah, we're having a community meeting on September 4th on this project. We'd like for you to attend. So I stopped the process with Rosie, and then we attended that meeting on September 4th. So we have held a community meeting with them. Um, Moving forward, so that's just a, a quick background. I, I brought a few slides forward because we can't always see it on, on black and white, and we did do a lot of fun drawing work. Um, we'd like to show you guys. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Uh, these are the same slides I showed in the uh, community meeting. You can go to the next one, Abby. Uh, oh, this one I didn't. I talked about it, but I didn't. There was a question about density and context and character and what we're doing and how are we meeting the neighborhood. And so in no way am I saying that Chesney Glen is overall the same density as what we're proposing, but I was curious, what is right next to us? And so I picked our property line up and moved it one over onto Chesney Glen. Keep in mind, we're proposing 55 lots. And when I pick ours up and move it right next door to us, you can see that Chesney Glen in that exact same area has 59 total lots and it's also touching 10 other lots. And so we're not really going way up in density. Uh, in fact, we're going down if you would take the exact same area from what's right next to us. So that's something I thought was interesting, but you can go to the next slide and kind of creates a good transition. So here's the concept that we, we have. Uh, from the start, a goal was to, how can we creatively and responsibly uh, piece together this puzzle on, on, a, on a property that's shaped like this? It's long and it's narrow along the long side. There is a, a public road. We don't want to have double frontage lots. We don't want to have the rear of the buildings facing New Hope Road. Uh, we want to be sensitive to our neighbors in the surrounding areas. We want to have every view and perspective considered as you're driving down New Hope while you're in the development and as you drive past. So we've internalized the density. We didn't want to push it out to the edges. We wanted to keep it inside. Rather than have the backs of houses to New Hope Road, we want to orient the open space, the community gathering space, the home frontages, all to the public. We want the, everybody to see the front door. Uh, we wanted pedestrian connectivity. We have a very strong pedestrian network going all through the site, connecting to all the adjacent um, uh, sidewalks, we're installing new sidewalk along New Hope Road, the entire property frontage. We created pocket courtyards to be engaged by the residents and also aesthetically pleasing to the public. So as you go down New Hope Road, you see these breaks in the development. And rather than looking at just some grass, we wanted to do something a little bit more. And we started thinking, how can we, how can we activate these open spaces? What is going to be look really nice but also provide the residents something that they can use all the time? And then go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, uh, back one. On that one and this one here, you're looking at you know top-down view now. Uh, we're going to do a community garden, and not just a community garden that uh, everybody comes out and has to take care of them themselves. The HOA will be the ones maintaining it, so that it doesn't just grow up in weeds. Um, little features along there, every, every feature was thought about, the, the landscaping, the entry monumentation, the uh, providing a, a water fountain in the uh, rain garden courtyard. You can go to the next slide. And we want to even think about the stormwater. How do we integrate stormwater into the development? And so this is where our rain gardens are. 
We don't want just the normal rain gardens. We want it to look like a, a place that's inviting that you can come and have a courtyard and, and, and sit down and engage it. Um, how do we in integrate the residential character but yet provide a more robust gathering space in the internal residence? Uh, next slide. Another thing that's uh, was able to work on this project that isn't on all of them. The developer and home builder are the same. And so this isn't being transferred off to another builder. These are the actual houses being built. In the, in the, the renderings you're seeing and up on the slides there, those are the actual products that have been designed around. Um, you can go to the next slide. There's multiple types of units, multiple facades. These are the rear loaded products. So we have a rear loaded uh, alleyways. These are the front-loaded manor units that go along the public street that's being proposed. You can go to the next one. Uh, here's our streetscape. Again, the spacing, everything is per the plans. This is, you know, the, the same perspective. Uh, you can go to the next one. And finally, these are just some pictures we pulled out. These are similar type neighborhoods throughout the country. Uh, these pocket neighborhoods, the courtyards, they're working in other neighborhoods. And this is what we have in mind when we want to propose this development. You know, have some place that, that you can be proud of, engage, it's going to look good. And we have responsibly kept the houses together so that we can have more open space. Um, we believe that this type of development is going to engage community. It's going to raise housing values. We think it's a positive for the community. Uh, we agree with staff's recommendation. This property and project meets the policy, and I uh, would really appreciate your approval on it. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, and you'll have two minutes and I would, for rebuttal. Yeah, I'm sorry, reserve my time for rebuttal. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anybody here speaking in support of this project? Anybody speaking in opposition? Okay. Uh, if you will line up, um, come forward one at a time, uh, but if you could just do us a favor and line up so we just keep things moving. Um, and I will just ask you, since there's quite a few of you speaking, um, just think about what you're saying, and if you feel like you're, the person in front of you said something similar, it's okay to say ditto or me too, or just keep going. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Oleg Volk. I live at 3112 uh, Chambly Court, which is directly adjacent to the development. I was never invited uh, in the initial process with Steve Glover. Uh, even though my property is directly adjacent, and I did a green overlay of my property over the orange of the adjacent uh, uh, plot on the new development, and you can see the difference in sizes. Uh, I consulted my real estate agent for the estimate on the drop in value, which was estimated about 10% of the current value. To me, the change is a formerly private backyard is no longer private. We have a parking lot right under our windows which would cause noise, the usual issue with traffic, uh, and the two old growth trees that are bordering my lot are coming down which takes out all of the shade that is currently available. So to me, the value of this development is strictly negative. Uh, and uh, the note that the uh, area, uh, that the uh, size of the lots is on average the same is not quite correct because it is counting engineering areas like the water runoff uh, plot uh, and the uh, common areas as part of the plots, which they're not in the new development. I would be much happier if this development was zoned similar to, to what it is now with larger plots uh, as opposed to the much higher density than previously, which would negatively affect the neighborhood and uh, basically uh, be a new area at the expense of the current residents. I would appreciate if this could be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you for the attention. Uh, if you would like to submit it, you can hand that to Abby and she'll circulate. Thank you. Thank you. I'm on. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Phelps. Uh, I live at 6317 North New Hope Road across uh, from this development. And uh, I want to uh, say that uh, the presentation that Mr. Sager made uh, at our community meeting, which uh, was not set up by the uh, uh, 
builder or the developer was set up by the community uh, was a very nice presentation, and I think that uh, for the most part the uh, proposal uh, is a good one uh, for somewhere. I'm not sure that uh, it is the right fit for this area. And my principal concern is if you look at the connection with North New Hope Road, you'll note that that uh, connection is right in a curve. And though they uh, propose putting in a turn lane, that would be absolutely necessary. That is a, it's a much more dangerous curve than it looks like, just looking at that picture. As a matter of fact, since I've lived there, there have been fatal accidents. There was a school bus accident right there where a child received, uh, had an injury that's lifelong, paralysis and what have you. It's a, it's a dangerous curve. There have been fatal accidents there. It's just not a good spot uh, to connect a road. And there is an alternative. If you look on up north uh, on the uh, proposal, there is another uh, stubbed out street up there from Chesney Glen that's stubbed out for the specific purpose, I assume, of connectivity and uh, could be used to connect that property to uh, North New Hope Road in a much safer area. Uh, so uh, that's one point I'd like to make. I'd also like to say that uh, our uh, a councilman uh, did, as, as far as I know, meet with a few selected members of the community, not with the majority of people. Uh, most of us were not given any notice. Is my time up? That's your two minutes, yes. I've got at least five more minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sydney Bennett. Um, I live in Mistletoe, on Mistletoe Circle in New Hope Meadows subdivision. I have lived there for 28 years. We built that house. And I travel up and down this area uh, twice a day, every day, as does my husband. Um, he's a judge on the Court of Appeals, and he travels the same road that, that I do, uh, I'll, even though I'm now in the grandmother status instead of the practice and law status. Um, I got involved in this because Dr. Phelps uh, called me one night and said, did you know that this was going to be developed and they're going to put 53 houses on this and what can we do? And I said, well, no, I didn't know about that. And uh, I started making some phone calls and I'm the one that did set up the meeting because um, Mr. Glover had not set up a meeting with all the people who would be directly um, involved in this, uh, contrary to the way the uh, regs are, as I understand them at least. Um, the gentleman that spoke first was not connected, and I have at least three other people who were at the meeting that I arranged that were not um, connect contacted either. Um, they didn't know about it, and their property directly touches this property. Um, this is concerning to me um, for many reasons. Now, that's my first problem with this. Um, but I did want uh, a community meeting because we needed to know what was going on. Um, the other issue that I want to touch on, since I've only got 30 seconds left, is that um, as someone who has watched all of these places be built over the last 28 years, uh, there are now five subdivisions down this one mile of North New Hope Road. Uh, ours was the first. And in watching them, um, this is the first one I've ever had a problem with. And the problem is this does not look like anything else in this area. And that, as I understand it, does not comply with the Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory Community uh, Plan or the Nashville Next Plan. It is totally different from anything. Even uh, Mr. Bill Charles with Dale said that it is very different from anything that you typically see in this area. And that's a direct quote. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. My name is Erin Evans. I live at 5109 Vineyard Point in Hermitage. I'm not a neighbor who's directly impacted by this development, but I'm here tonight representing the Donaldson Hermitage Neighborhood Association, and we voted as an organization to support the neighbors who are against this current proposal. Um, our representative from Dale & Associates did a, a really good job of explaining the development and talking it through, but I think it really illustrates that experimental communication in neighborhoods um, such as our councilman did, does not work. We need to be more fully engaged. So while we all recognize that this is a plot of land that will be developed, I personally feel, as does DHNA, that we need to involve the community more, and there's also an opportunity to continue to improve this development with more community engagement. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Excuse me. 
Susan? No. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mark Hammock. I'm the president of the Cobblestone Landing HOA subdivision, coming right off Landings Way. Um, I actually appreciate uh, Mr. Seeger laying out uh, the, um, the 10 acres over Chesney Glen and showing that there would be 59 lots there. However, those homes don't fit the essence of our neighborhood, Cobblestone Landing or the neighboring neighbor, uh, neighborhoods. Um, if it were just homes, uh, single family homes that were similar to ours, it would make more sense and I would be more in line to agree with it. It's gonna be developed, I get that, so I just want something that makes more sense for us. Um, I just feel like they're really maximizing profits and not uh, and sacrificing the flow of the community. Phase one, phase two of the of Cobblestone Landing, our average lot size is 0.21 to 0.27. So if you do the math on that, that, that shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't have 55 homes in a 10 acre area. So I'm not sure if you considered that, but because uh, they, he did say that they were considering the values of Cobblestone Landing, the homes of Cobblestone Landing. So if you're taking that as a comp, then let's make it apples to apples. So look at the phase one lot sizes, and then I wouldn't have a problem with it, to be honest with you. I don't like the road, but I understand that they've got to put in somewhere. <clears throat> and that's it. That's, uh, that's my time. I appreciate if you guys would vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name's Dina Swanner, and I live at 5917 Colchester Drive, which is the, in the Farmingham Woods neighborhood, which is directly south of where they are planning this development. And my issue is with traffic and with the road. Uh, the photo that he showed, that the picture was very lovely, but that is actually not North New Hope Road. North New Hope Road is a very small, winding, hilly uh, country road. It is dangerous. The gentleman earlier mentioned fatal accidents on that curve. It is extremely dangerous. I travel it every day. And then there's also the congestion, driving to work and back, because North New Hope Road has pretty much two outlets. It's Old Lebanon Dirt Road and Central Pike. Central Pike has been designated as a place to be widened for many, many years, and it still has not been widened. And what used to take 10 minutes, five minutes to get from North New Hope Road to Old Hickory Boulevard now takes over 30 minutes sometimes. Uh, we have seen a dramatic increase in congestion and traffic and accidents, and that does not include another development that is very close to this one. It's called Evans Hill that was recently approved with about 350 homes that has not been completed, and it will have a cut through that also pours onto North New Hope Road. So at this moment, I am on the Neighborhood Association for Farmingham Woods, and everyone is against this. They have no objections to this area being developed, but we are all asking that the zoning remain in place until Central Pike gets widened or other factors be taken into account. Thank you for your time. My name is Michael Korak, and I'm the president of the Homeowners Association that Dina spoke of uh, Farmingham Woods, immediately south of this proposed development. The plan, the pictures, the layout, excellent, but not in this location, primarily because of the infrastructure. Our traffic is very, very bad. These roads are extremely narrow. North New Hope Road, Old Lebanon Dirt Road, Tulip Grove Road, and Central Pike in the mornings and in the evenings. We have a great deal of incoming traffic from Wilson County. Tremendous. Mile and a half, two mile backups on Central and on Old Lebanon Dirt Road because those go directly through to Mount Julia. As you probably know, if you haven't been out there, I don't have a large map to show you the detail. These roads are not ready. Not ready for the I think it's still called the Evans Hill 300 homes that are going to be primarily off of Tulip Grove Road, but also they're going to have access on Central Pike through the Valley Grove subdivision and through Myra Drive onto North New Hope Road. That's 300 homes, and they are being built immediately behind our Farmingham Woods. So it's infrastructure from a road standpoint, a traffic problem 
These are all very curvy and quite narrow roads. If you haven't driven them, I invite you to do so. Preferably in the day, you'll have a better chance. Uh, the, the other issue, and I, I don't know if it was addressed in the documentation, but we do have, through our subdivision, a stream. It's a, a sub, subset of Stones River. It runs immediately behind us. It has a pumping station. A new pumping station is being added to the existing one right now for the Evans Hill. Here's 50 more homes coming in. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Hello, uh, my name is Peter Whitlow. I live at 3033 Glenboro Drive, which is the street that's at the top of the picture there. Um, I don't know if, according to that, it looks like it might be connected to the street that's coming through. I can't really tell. Can't see that far away. <laughs> but um, if it is, it's too narrow of a street for any additional traffic. It's a very narrow street. We have no room to widen it. Um, and it definitely doesn't need to be uh, any additional traffic on it. Also, I agree with the gentleman there about the infrastructure. It is definitely going to be a, a dangerous situation, especially on Old Lebanon Dirt Road where New Hope Road comes out. It's, a, it's already a very da dangerous intersection, and uh, people come through there excessively fast, and someone's going to get hurt or killed, especially with additional 55 homes. And 55 homes fit into this area will overload the, the infrastructure in that area. And it's just way too many homes to be built in that amount of space. We definitely need to be reconsidered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, y'all. My name's Amy Gibbons. I live at 3112 Chamberlain Court, which is one of the houses that is going to buttress this uh, new development if it happens, and that is why I'm here today. To begin with, we would be losing, as my partner stated, our private backyard, which was one of the great draws of this property. When this was bought, that um, losing that was not taken into consideration, and it is one of the prime examples of my argument today, which is that this goes against the fundamental um, value of fairness. Everybody who brought, bought their properties in these areas bought them with the idea that we would be getting a certain neighborhood and a certain field that would be there to stay. Nobody is saying that this area should not be developed. We are saying that it should be developed in accordance with the neighborhoods around it, which this is not. Even without that taken into consideration, we would like for you to consider what most of us have been saying, which is the overload on traffic. I drive those roads every day, and we have a severe problem on these little one-lane roads going back to Tulip Grove, Central Pike. Before any development can happen, those need to be widened because we will have severe backup if they are not. There is also the question of how the developer has gone about this. My major complaint with them on that is they put out notices of the hearing on August 23rd, and they never updated those signs to tell people that it was actually going to be today. So when we went out to tell people to show up today, they didn't know it was happening, and they were not able to plan ahead because they were told that it was going to be on the 23rd, and then it didn't happen, and those signs were never updated. Again, these are the major points in my argument, which is that this goes against the principles of fundamental fairness, and we ask you to please reconsider and deny this. Thank you. Thank you. Howdy. I'm Wayne Sharber. My wife and I live on 6285 North New Hope Road on a five-acre lot directly across in front of this development. We have owned it for 40 years. We built the house and have lived there for 39 years. Our house footprint it has a footprint of 2,252 square feet. And today I understand from the typo correction, these lots now are proposed to be 2,300 square feet as opposed to 2,500 square feet. Also, I noticed in the beautiful pictures presented today, they're all two-story homes. In the 
original proposal of this, it shows that there were going to be three-story buildings. And I was thinking those people would be looking out at the power lines that run north and south on North New Hope Road. I want to point out some facts uh, uh, relative to the proposed design of this zoning request. And these facts are in addition to the email that I expounded, uh, shared with you all yesterday, and you may have gotten it in your package, and hopefully you all have looked at that. My first concern regarded that North uh, Nashville next plan, and that was all in that email of yesterday and so forth. So I don't want to repeat all of that, but what I want to point out are some additional factors, such as those factors for the environmental and natural resources concern. The existing house was built in 1944, has both asbestos siding and less bay paint. I hope the house will be demolished in such a fashion that the public is not, or the people around there are not impacted by ambient air pollution from these two horrible play, um, di uh, toxic substances and so forth. And also they need to plug three board well holes that are on the property properly with concrete, cut off the casings below the ground disturbance and so forth for uh, save some of the healthy trees at the house site by relocating that active open space area that's directly across in front of my property. The existing curve on New Hope Road, as many have already mentioned, is extremely dangerous. I would propose, and as I acknowledge further, that they make a connection onto North New Hope Road at Landings Way, where it would be a place where you'd logically put a stoplight. I have a handout material staff will share with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tim Weeks, uh, 6101 Hagers Grove Pass in Hermitage, also the president of the Donaldson Hermitage Neighborhood Association. I should get a few extra minutes, but I guess I won't. But uh, you sp Are you speaking on behalf of the Neighborhood Association? Then we will give you... I may not five. use it all, but okay. I think I should be entitled. Okay. Thank you. Um, my main point is that I've attended a number of meetings over the summer that's about neighborhood engagement in the community process. The NRC has sponsored these meetings, and uh, Commissioner Sims was there at one, and Councilman Bedney was there at one, and some other people have been there. But, you know, the, the, the one thing that keeps coming up is that neighborhood people feel like there's insufficient notice and problems or at least not being able to be engaged in this process in a proper way. And this is a textbook classic case of what aggravates neighborhood people, of why we're disconnected and not involved with you guys in a better, more positive way. Now let's, let's take this back just a few minutes. That Councilman Glover said that this started back in March or April. Uh, when, when the developer came to him. Well, he called a few friends to have a meeting. He didn't have a community meeting. He called a few friends that lived in the area and had a meeting. That's not community input. That's Councilman Glover avoiding community input. And I'm telling you, you should give this proposal a boot and send it back to the drawing board for that one reason. These good people found out about this proposal on their own. They weren't notified. The councilman didn't call a meeting. I heard about it in late August when I was getting on a plane to go on vacation. How could we do community organization in just a few weeks? It's amazing we have this many people down here to say anything or to send you an email. This is dysfunctional planning. This doesn't work. This is a nice proposal these guys seem to have put together. But the notice issue and the lack of community meetings is its greatest flaw. The one true community meeting was on September the 4th, and it was organized by Sidney Bennett, this lady sitting right out there, not Councilman Steve Glover. Now he was, I'll handicap him, he was at a Metro Council meeting that night. But he had months to put together a real community meeting. He didn't. Now, I know he's been busy with fighting soccer and the fairgrounds and budget and all these other things, but I live in his district and I can tell you constituent services is not his strength. He did not have this meeting properly with these neighbors who all live next door to it. So you guys should say, say look, 
go back to the beginning and do this correctly before you come here and ask us to decide whether this belongs here or not? That's my biggest argument on this particular development. The other that I'll mention just briefly is that the community plan for Donaldson, Harmony, and Old Hickory, the T3NE, which you guys all know about, calls for moderate density developments in our area. It's a suburban area, moderate density. Now what these guys are proposing is 55 homes on 10 acres, which is less than 0.2 acres per house. That's a postage stamp with a big house on it. That's not, I'm sorry, I disagree with your staff. That's not moderate density. This is inconsistent with the plan for Donaldson, Harmony, and Old Hickory. So that's another major reason to say, look, this doesn't belong here. This is taking East Nashville, a nice East Nashville downtown development, and dropping it right in the middle of Hermitage. It doesn't belong there. The subdivisions that are in this area are bigger. Now, what he showed in his slide was disingenuous and misleading. He took his 10 acres and slid it over just a little bit to show 59 homes in the next door neighborhood. Well, move it over a little bit further and you might get 15 homes. There are much larger lots with bigger of these other subdivisions in the area. This is out of the character of this neighborhood. And I'll say lastly that I noticed on a Facebook post today by Councilman Larry Hager that he had posted a picture of his family from John, John Hager Road, which is where I live, or off of there. And he mentioned the fact that his grandfather is buried behind the house, or great-grandfather, on North New Hope Road. It's country, it's rural, there's big subdivisions, it's beautiful, this doesn't belong there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Sheeps. I'm in the uh, New Hope Meadows uh, area. Um, the reason why I stepped in late is because I'm neither for or against it. I'm just kind of viewing this as like a bipartisan position. Yeah. I'm all for people coming in, you know, growing Nashville, raising property taxes, raising values. I'm all for that, but you know, I don't believe this is the right approach to the area. Um, there's going to be a higher density of traffic. I think a report needs to be done between Lebanon and Nashville just to see how much traffic is being flowed through. Um, I think that needs to look at uh, maybe some traffic lights um, to maybe slow down some of that traffic. I've got a new wife. I just bought a house. Five-year-old. I've got uh, a one-month-old um, as of today. They were almost T-boned on this road uh, about three months ago. So with the increased traffic, that's a real concern with me, but I think that all that can be alleviated with just some more better density reporting and maybe adding some traffic lights and maybe decreasing, you know, not 55 houses, but maybe, you know, something similar to cobblestone. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Apologize, I'm the, the yes. new guy that didn't know. Okay, so three so We're gonna give you an additional three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to go ditto on the East Nashville comment, and I also want to go um, ditto on the, the density. This isn't the right, this is supposed to be moderate. This is going to be, this proposal will be making that area too dense. Um, two of my neighbors have been um, directly impacted by accidents at that curve on North New Hope. One neighbor was killed in the middle of the night and uh, the other neighbor was uh, severely injured. Um, I see him at the pool a lot of times. Um, I'm one of those um, residents um, outgoing. I know all of my neighbors. Um, I spoke to 173 of our residents. Um, kind of old school, just it's my personality. I'm just a country boy. And so I knocked on doors and was like, well, what are your thoughts? What are you thinking? Posted stuff on Facebook, but I actually had face-to-face -face conversations with people. Uh, again, we're not saying that we don't want something there. We know something's gonna come. And some of the homes are nice looking homes, but it needs to, we don't want a little of this and a little of that just to maximize cost. We really want the homes to mirror what we have in Cobblestone Landing because again, that's what they were using as, as a comp. Um, it's a rural road. I mean, it's a two-lane road. The, the shoulders are a foot at best. Um, there's a telephone pole two feet off the edge of that 
corner uh, where the two people were, where one person died and the other was injured. So I would implore you guys to, to delay it or dis disapprove it and go out there and look, at, look yourself. And you'll see that this doesn't fit. Um, I'm being as sincere as possible. Uh, I've got three kids. I've been there for 11 years. I love this community. I know my neighbors and we spoke and this isn't what they want. It's just not the right, uh, the right blend for our neighborhood. So I really would appreciate if you guys consider uh, disapproving or delaying this for further um, insight. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vicki Jones. I live in New Hope Meadows. I'm here as a resident of 19 years of New Hope Meadows. Um, I spoke at the council meeting when there was a proposal to put something at the corner of North New Hope and Old Lebanon Dirt Road because you couldn't see with just the sign for that meeting. I spend eight minutes getting to the, inter to the interstate on Central Pike when on Saturday and Sunday. I spend 15 to 20 going multiple other ways to get to the interstate Monday through Friday. So the infrastructure, you can't walk along the old Lebanon Dirt Road or Central Pike without taking your life in your hands or on North New Hope, which I've done a few times and have to get in the ditch. So there's not the infrastructure to support more traffic. We already have too much traffic. We can't get anywhere. And it's not really safe to be able to do anything that's not in a car, and then you're risking your life in a car. I also think the, cherry, the comps with New Hope Meadows and Cobblestone Landing were cherry-picked, and they chose what they wanted for that. I also, uh, supposedly this developer did the Aaron's Crest, and after Aaron's Crest was developed, the, there was like a creek that would run across the North New Hope every time there was a major rain and you'd have like major flooding. So I can't say that that example is a good example of what's going to happen in terms of runoff and drainage from this new development. And I also think that it would be really nice to have more affordable housing that people that made under $100,000 could actually afford to live in the area. Uh, it doesn't also, we've got the whole problem with Wilson County coming in this way, which adds to the whole traffic problem, so. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in opposition? Okay, the applicant, you'll have two, min two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, I'll just hit the main points here in my rebuttal in two minutes. Um, a lot was talked about the notices. Just wanna reiterate, we did go through the normal procedures and processes of the SP rezoning. We sent out postcards, we sent out letters, we have put up signs. This was scheduled for the August 23rd meeting, it got deferred. We put up another sign for today's meeting. We have, I, I have emails, I don't have them with me. I have emails to Rosie down at council to schedule a community meeting. We started that process. And then because the other neighborhood meeting was scheduled, I said, Rosie, we've already got one scheduled. We're just gonna go meet with them. So we have held community meetings. Uh, Mr. Glover, did require us to hold a larger community meeting, that there was nothing skirted around. We were told by Mr. Glover, hey, you gotta call Rosie, hold these meetings, and we did so. Um, infrastructure, we are improving New Hope Road along the entire property frontage. We have to do some more pavement, curb and gutter, grass strips, sidewalks. We're putting in a turn lane which should widen the pavement and make that curve a little bit safer. We're on the correct side of the curve. Whenever you pull up to a curve, you wanna be able to look right and left and see kinda out, not looking back, and so we're on the correct side of the curve which is gonna make for a more safer turn movement even if we abutted it perpendicularly. And so we're making every effort. Uh, traffic is associated with that. We all live in Nashville, I do too. We're feeling the traffic impacts. On North New Hope Road and some of these through roads, a lot of this is Wilson County, Mount Juliet, people cutting through. There are a tremendous amount of people coming down Central Pike, Old Lebanon, all of these roads. Um, the traffic studies show that 55 homes just really doesn't impact. It, are there more cars? Yeah, there's more cars because we're developing under our normal zoning, but by and large, a lot of the traffic coming through is offsite and we're doing the best we can to mitigate, so thank you all. Thank you. 
All right, I will declare the public hearing closed, and I'm going to ask Commissioner Haynes to kick us off. Lovely. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. We've, we've had the two minutes and... Well, just that he brought up... About no, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So I am troubled by the lack of transparency in this case um, and whether or not the neighborhood was having a meeting of their own accord. I do think the developer and the council person should have arranged a meeting. So I think we need to learn from that and we need to be more, much more transparent with our community members. Um, in looking at the T3 neighborhood evolving policy, it talks about low intensity residential development. And I have to disagree with staff here. I don't think 2,300 square foot lots qualifies for low intensity residential development. Um, I am troubled by the nature of this roadway um, and the amount of lots being developed in this neighborhood. I think we're getting development ahead of infrastructure in this case. Um, so at this point in time, I'm leaning to voting against staff's recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Sims, welcome back. Well, thank you very much. I think I'm going to sound like an echo to Commissioner Haynes, but I think due process is absolutely guaranteed by policy. And for some reason, I'm not sure what it was. The miscommunication is there. And this is, for me, just step one. If we don't have some type of documented, well-attended community meeting, then we haven't offered the due process that we're held responsible for. I think the second thing is I drove out there twice Sunday and went up and down the road, and I actually got afraid. And I thought, what would this road be like on a Sunday? I mean, on some other day other than a Sunday. And I started looking at how really crowded the housing is behind this development and how little entry there is. And so this is a case where we truly are getting our um, further development way ahead of infrastructure. So I don't often agree with, with Jeff Haynes, but I do today. <laughs> Commissioner Gobble? Um, I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm was kind of leaning to supporting the staff's position, but you know, I, I am concerned about that road and where it hits. One question for the staff: If we, they showed a lot of, a lot of uh, <clears throat> drawings and renderings with fairly rich landscape designs and architectural de detailing. Is that? in any way part of the submission if they chose not to do any of those things. Those are expensive elements. The official submission is, is the plan sheets that we have um, that don't include those renderings, but you may ask and the applicant may you know, be willing to include those renderings in the official SP documentation so that that would go along um, with the plans that we already have on file. So we don't have any of those renderings as part of the official application, but if that's something you want to request um, and the applicant is willing to add them and include them in the official SP, we can, we can certainly ask. Can I clarify, Abby, are there design standards and standards for setbacks and materials and the like? There are some design, so the height, um, three stories and 36 feet. There's um, some prohibited materials, some um, glazing requirements. Uh, tr traditional SP architectural standards are included um, with, with that. But, if, but as far as the renderings, um, that would be something that's not specifically part of the application. Well, I, again, I think my concern um, again about the traffic and how it hits New Hope Road and how, you know, it's going to take some, I was not impressed with the plan until I saw how they would may finish it out. And if they don't finish it out like that, if, then I would be definitely unimpressed with the plan. So I'm willing to listen to my other commissioners and see where we're going. Commissioner Moore? So I have similar concerns as those already stated. Um, so this received approval from Public Works, but I was wondering if maybe it could be elaborated on because it does seem like a lot of traffic going up and down that road and if they deemed it appropriate, I just would like to know kind of what the thought process was. Uh, 
Uh, we have a member of, of, is here. Do you want to come up? of our traffic division up here. Bev can come and speak to any conditions. Um, I knew how narrow that new hope is, and um, so I did ask for a left turn lane. Um, I think there's limited right of way, so most of it will, in, in widening the road and getting the sidewalks and the grass strip, it will probably be widened into their property. So at least along the frontage, we can get the road widened somewhat. Um, there is a lot of traffic out there. Um, I know that there is a, there was a plan at one time to widen um, Central Pike, and I don't know where that is in the um, um, uh, process. Um, I believe I saw a plan a couple of years ago to widen several of the intersections along Central Pike. Um, it's 55 homes. It's not a lot of traffic that they are contributing in, in the peak hour. And, that, and we, we look at the peak hour flow, usually. Um, I have requested a traffic access study to be um, conducted and submitted before the final SP is approved. Um, I would expect that we'll get two exiting lanes on their road um, uh, coming out on North New Hope. I would expect that probably if there's a, um, a, um, enough right of way on, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the road, but the one that goes up the existing um, subdivision that goes up to Eleven and Dirt Pike. Um, I think that striping in two exiting lanes there would be of benefit. Um, like I say, I think the curve can be modified a little bit by the widening on their side of the um, of the of North New Hope Road. You may find that um, there is a curve warning sign there now, and. Um, it's with a um, speed limit reduction of 30 miles per hour. Part of the um, plan, uh, part of the study may require them to look at, do a uh, speed limit study to see if perhaps that road needs a lower speed limit. Um, so there's, I, since it's only 55 homes, it's it's um, it's not easy to go too far away from that property. You know, going all the way up to Old Lebanon Dirt Road or down to Central Pike would be difficult for 55 homes. I believe the legislation has a full impact study. Traffic study is required at 75 homes. Thank you. And can you say, I didn't hear your name, just so oh, that we I'm have sorry. it for the record. Beverly Amaral. I'm a traffic engineer with Public Works. Thank you. Everybody's talking about new hope. Sir, sir. No. Thank you. No. Sir. No. No. Okay. Bank. We hear you, sir. 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 Thank you. We've heard. So I think in addition, in addition to the traffic part, I do have concerns like that was stated about the community involvement along, but I'll continue to listen. Commissioner Michelle. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I have a couple questions just to make sure. So um, the, the development just to the left, I understand that those lots are um, minimum lot size is 0.21 acre, is that correct? So the Chesney Glen subdivision, let me just scroll up here. 
uh, Chesney Glen is right here. And that subdivision has, uh, it's at a density of 3.86 dwelling units per acre. So the minimum lot size, it's in a pod, a planned unit development. So the minimum lot size is 5,000 square feet for those lots. Some of them are bigger, uh, but that was the minimum established with Chesney Glen. Um, the development directly south of Chesney Glen here, which is Farmingham Woods, um, is also in a pod and um, minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet and the um, density is 4.78 acres per acre. Um, this subdivision would be 5.5 dwelling units per acre. So if you went by the, the most dense of those two, how many um, dwellings could you have on this particular section? Let me figure out that math real quick. Okay, okay. and I can ask more questions while you're doing that if you don't Yeah, think. yeah, okay. sure. Um, the um, other uh, thing I wanted to know, uh, I wanted to clarify, are they I two stories? I think Lisa's is already solved the math problem. Yay. <laughs> Uh, so the, the the one to the south there, that's 4.7. So we would be looking at around 47 um, units on this property if it was consistent with the density of that one to the south. Now, I will note that both of those subdivisions, um, Chesney Glen and the one to the south there, are within a maintenance policy, and this is an evolving policy. So they are a different policy area as well. Okay. And that's what I had come up with, 48. So we're pretty close there. So... Um, okay, and they've asked for 55, but you've taken one off, so they're really asking for 54. So there's a difference of six lots here between what the community is requesting and what the developers are requesting, correct? Okay, so another thing I want to clarify is, are these two-story houses or three-story houses? You said three stories and 35 feet, I think. The, um, there were standards that were included on the plan, but the developer has indicated that they would include those, um, the elevations that were shown of the homes into the SP, so then that would be the standard. Oh, okay. So if they show those, then that binds them to the two-story. Yeah, they've agreed to include those in with the SP, those elevations, and so then those would be the elevations that were approved. They could have slight modifications, but the height would be as shown in those elevations. Okay. Um, does this comply with Nashville Next and the community plan? So in neighborhood evolving policies, um, there's, it, there's opportunities for change and whether that means um, different housing type or whether that means additional connections that encourage um, a, transportation and um, enhance uh, pedestrian connectivity, that sort of thing. Um, it it um, could mean different things depending on the site, depending on the context, depending on the surroundings. And so in this case, staff felt that this plan was consistent with evolving policy. The site's located along a collector avenue. Um, a lot of the, the surrounding subdivisions are located on local streets. And so, um, and they have a s similar density. And so with this, you've, you've got uh, located along a collector and that gives further reason for um, um, you know, some potential for change um, that uh, given the existing street connectivity and what's around it. And looking at the wider area, you do see that there are some subdivisions, um, especially in this area and along Lebanon Dirt Road. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So I think um, for me, I, I really, I feel like what they've designed is really beautiful. Um, and like you said, um, Commissioner Gobble, if they stick to the drawings, it's really beautiful. And um, But I also hear um, people in the community who feel like they haven't been heard or um, talked to, and I can see that um, they're not that far apart on the number of properties <coughs> here, and there might be a way for the community to way in and, and they might be a way for them to get to agreement. So um, I would be inclined to ask for a deferral um, so that they could have more community meetings and get to some of this, but I'm not gonna say for sure that's what I wanna do. I wanna just keep listening. Thank you. Commissioner Blackshear. 
Um, well, just, I guess, to follow up on her point about the deferral, I mean, is there any type of problem with having a deferral? Okay, so the applicant has agreed to a two-meeting deferral, so I got a text on that. I was, we wanted to wait and let the commissioner sort of put the issues on the table so that when we make the motion to defer, it's clear, and I've got a running list, what issues you want us to look at. Um, so don't know if you'd like to kind of keep going through or if it sounds like that may be the di a good direction for us to go in. Um, but yes, they have agreed to a two-meeting deferral. Okay, well, so, I mean, all the issues that were previously raised were questions I had. Really, my main question was whether um, this plan was consistent with policy. It sounds like what is moderate density to one person is not moderate density to another person. Although, if you look at the number of lots that are proposed, this plan and compare them to the lot sizes or the number of lots that are in um, neighboring subdivisions, it doesn't seem like it would be that different. Um, so I really have no other issues to add, but I would be in favor of a deferral. Commissioner Tiff, we don't want you left out. I know. <laughs> you got to have some. Actually, and I just wanted to ask about the connection up toward uh, Lebanon. Is that right? No, Landings Way. Is there a connection? That, there's not a connection there, right, at that road? So there is, there is, there are two existing sub streets that stub into this property. The one to the south. Can you show? Oh, yes, sorry. Can you show where we're looking? <laughs> Maybe on the, uh, yeah, other one. There are two existing substreets that stub into this property from the adjacent property to the west. Um, Do you mind going to the, um, here? the actual, yeah. Uh, yeah, so here, and this is the connection that's being provided. And then there's an additional stub street here that is not connecting. Um, one of the reasons that that is not connecting was in looking at how that would um, go through the property to Landing Way, um, it would likely create an offset intersection. Um, it wouldn't be able to align perfectly with Landing Way. And that creates um, some safety issues also because we try we try to avoid um, offset intersections, and so that was um, a reason to not connect to that stub street as opposed to one of the south. Well, um, and just the, the point that I would just bring up for the deferment is uh, the, uh, public, the uh, from Public Works about the traffic access study. Feels like we kind of need that, listening to everything. Um, it, it would be nice if it, I understand the reason why I think now, but uh, it would be nice if it was a connection toward Landings Way. Um, that I think that, you know, I don't know if it works, but if it could be lined up with it, I think that would be better. Um, and the distance for the dead end, I guess that's okay, but um, uh, just maybe that can just make sure that's studied. I, it probably is fine, but the, de the dead end corridor is what we call it in architects, but, you know, just to make sure that that's fine as far as fire trucks and getting in and out and in both directions, actually, since there is not a connection to the top, but uh, that whole fire truck thing, you don't want to get them locked into it. So uh, that's it. That's the only other thing I want to add to deferral. If, if you tell me all the points, I'll make the motion. <laughs> I think that would be great, and Lucy's got a long list. Okay, so you're recommending a two-meeting deferral. Uh, do we need the date on that? October uh, 11th? Okay. I think a two-meeting deferral will be enough. Okay. Um, and uh, you'd like us to evaluate the lot sizes as they relate to surrounding properties, uh, density, access points, you'd like to include elevations in the submittal, and recommend a community meeting to be a community meeting. And the traffic study. Yeah. And the traffic are we a traffic study or a traffic access study? I think for me it's traffic. access study. Yeah, for me it's traffic access unless you want to do the other two. Okay. okay. Can I ask one more question that was raised by um, one of the, the uh, speakers, but that had to do with the trees. And I see a couple of conditions 
that reference the pre-preservation, the tree preservation study. Can you maybe just talk briefly about that? I don't know if that's something else that we would need to have looked into um, and what the conditions are that have been required. There's a condition, so there's some mature trees down here that the, um, that well, they're noted to be retained, and then there's also a tree preservation easement that goes along the backs of these lots uh, along the western property line, and so that was a note uh, because it, I think it was a typographical correction because it was reading um, uh, landscape preservation buffer, and so we wanted to make sure that it said landscape preservation easement, that it matched because there was a note about preserving the trees and the landscape preservation easement. So that's all it was, and that, that's located along behind these larger lots um, along the western property line. But there's no, that does not run up to the north, so for the, for the person he spoke earlier. Yeah, so then there's a separate condition um, because there's some surface parking here uh -huh. um, that they include um, additional vegetation, including evergreen screening for, especially for the um, the surface parking spaces that are um, perpendicular to the property line, so the ones that are parked um, perpendicular to the drive, that we include extra um, evergreen screening there. Okay. But there's no, there's no mature trees up there that we need to look at? There's none that are shown to be retained on the northern half of the site. I think it's a little different. There's not really much canopy in this area that's, that's noted to be preserved. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay I like, ready? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a motion for a two mean deferral for staff to evaluate lot sizes, density, access points, I'd also like for um, elevations to be included uh, and a community meeting for um, make sure everyone is um, able, uh, notified and be able, at least notified and then a traffic access study be completed. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. <coughs> So, I know we often take a break around six. Okay. Do we have? Does anybody need a? Does anybody need a restroom or snack break, or do we want to go ahead and keep going? Keep going. All right. Well, then we will move on to our next item. No, I just know Greg likes to give us a break at six, so he's trying to be considerate. All right. We're moving on to item number six, which is the Woodlawn subdivision. Item number six is a request for a concept plan approval to create four lots on 2.88 acres located at 3700 Woodlawn Drive uh, in the RS20 single family zoning district. Um, the site is located between Wilson Boulevard to the west and Bowling Avenue to the east. As a reminder, this item was deferred from the August 1st and August 23rd, 2018 Planning Commission meetings. Um, no public hearing was held on August 1st, and a public hearing was held and closed on August 23rd, 2018. The um, staff recommendation is to approve. Um, and as a refresher, um, at the May 10th, 2018 Metro Planning Commission meeting, the Planning Commission disapproved case 2018-S-046-001, which was a concept plan with five lots, which included this site and an adjacent western parcel located here. Um, following staff's recommendation of disapproval as the proposed subdivision did not meet the compatibility criteria for infill subdivisions, and not all agencies had recommended approval. The proposed subdivision under review, which is case 2018-S-117-001, is a new concept plan with four lots and does not include the adjacent parcel located here. 
the August 23rd, uh, 2018 Planning Commission meeting, the Commission considered the current application. Uh, the item was deferred for one meeting until tonight, and the plan is unchanged from the plan reviewed at the August 23rd um, Planning Commission meeting. The site contains an existing residence which is indicated to be retained and included on one of the lots uh, proposed for subdivision. For reference, uh, here again is the existing lot um, that was included in the previous proposal. This lot is an existing buildable lot. Here is a view of the site as it relates to the entire block face from Wilson Boulevard over here to Bowling Avenue. Um, all lots are proposed to be accessed from a new public street, which would generally align with the existing Lindbrook Road um, south of Woodlawn Drive. The site is zoned RS20. You'll notice that both sides of Woodlawn Avenue um, are zoned RS20, and these properties were down zoned a couple of years ago. Additional properties um, in the area have been down zoned to single family zoning districts uh, in recent years. The site is located in neighborhood maintenance policy, which is intended to preserve the general character of developed residential neighborhoods. Uh, while National Next includes uh, limited guidance for subdivisions, Metro subdivision regulations control how land is divided and the pattern of development um, to reflect different contexts and character. This site plan uh, proposes four lots. Um, ranging from approximately 20,000 square feet to over 37,000 square feet. All lots would be accessed from a new public street um, that would align with Lindbergh Road located um, on the south side of Woodlawn Drive. Proposed lot four, which is located here, sorry, I can't see the mouse, um, contains an existing residence which um, is indicated to be retained on um, the proposed lot. The subdivision regulations include compatibility criteria for infill subdivisions and neighborhood maintenance policy areas. The proposed lots meet the minimum requirements of the RS20 zoning district and all lots will have frontage on a public street. Section 3-5.2 of the subdivision regulations requires that newly created lots in areas that are previously subdivided and predominantly developed must be comparable to the surrounding lots in regards to lot area, frontage, setback, and orientation. The surrounding parcels as defined by the subdivision regulations are the five RRS, AR2A, or AG parcels oriented to the same block face on either side of the proposal, uh, of the parcel proposed for subdivision or to the end of the same block face, whichever is less. In this instance, proposed lot four, which is highlighted in yellow, um, is located along an existing street, uh, Woodlawn Drive, and lots one, two, and three are located along a new public street. Therefore, only, only lot four is reviewed against the compatibility require, uh, criteria for infill subdivisions. The surrounding parcels are shown in light purple. Beginning with uh, lot frontage, um, along Woodlawn Drive, lot four must have frontage at least equal to 123.68 feet. Lot four has 188.98 feet of frontage and therefore meets um, compatibility requirements for frontage. For lot area, uh, lot along Woodlawn Drive, lot four must be equal to or greater than approximately 37,363 square feet and proposed lot four is approximately 37,363 square feet and therefore meets compatibility requirements for area. For street setbacks, when the minimum required uh, setback is less than the average of the two of the street setback of the two uh, parcels abutting either side of the lot proposed to be subdivided, a minimum building setback shall be included on the proposed lots at the average setback. Um, in this case, a minimum building setback is not required to be platted because uh, the existing structures will be retained on lot four. However, future structures would, would have to comply with the setbacks as established by the Metro Zoning Code. Um, finally, uh, both lots or lot four is oriented um, uh, consistent with the surrounding parcels. 
So while there is a consistent lot pattern along this section of Woodlawn Drive with no intervening streets, the proposal introduces a new street that changes the configuration of lots and may alter the character along um, Woodlawn Drive. However, the proposal meets the requirements of the subdivision regulations for an infill subdivision. The proposed concept plan differs from the previous plan in that it does not include the adjacent parcel 006. The exclusion of parcel 006 from the proposed development results in one new lot, lot four, fronting Woodlawn, instead of the two lots that fronted Woodlawn um, in the previous proposal. The street layout was also modified on the proposed concept plan, increasing the size of lot four. Based on the subdivision regulations definitions of surrounding parcels, lot four meets the area and frontage requirements of the surrounding lots, and the proposed subdivi subdivision complies with the compatibility requirements of the subdivision regulations, and therefore staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Thank you. So just to refresh everyone's memory, we, we did hear this one at length uh, at our last meeting, and because of that and because there haven't been any substantial changes to the plan, we are not going to reopen the public hearing. Is that okay with everybody? And can we confirm that for those that were not here at the last meeting that you have listened to the lengthy public hearing? I did. Okay. <laughs> Confirmed. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Commissioner Tibbs, I'm going to let you, you kick us off on this one. Um, well, I, I guess I still have um, some of my similar concerns, but, um, you know, as we kind of were talking about the context, um, last time. The, the, I guess the only thing I would just was curious about is just the, the area that was um, studied for it, um, that the, the, as far as the context for it, the character, that was kind of the issue that I had around the street. Um, I do drive this street all the time and this, uh, this still seems like a, a break of it to me to have a cul-de-sac here. Uh, so I um, how big is the review area? Is the area too big that we're looking at? Those are kind of my questions about it. So in general, the infill subdivision regulations kind of outline how you review these. Um, there's different criteria that they outline. Um, there are there's specific um, compatibility requirements for lots that front on an existing street. Um, and so in this case, the only lot that is created that is fronting on an existing street is that lot four that's highlighted there for you in yellow. Um, the subdivision regulations are then very specific in regards to which lots you use to compare it to. Um, and so those are the ones that are highlighted in purple there in regards to how big and how um, wide it needs to be on that existing street. And so the infill subdivision regulations speak um, a lot to the configuration of lots along an existing street. Now in this case we do have a new street that is being um, inserted the, the uh, close that is being created that aligns generally lit with Lindbrook across the street. Um, the subdivision regulations speak to things such as um, separation of roads, sight distance, um, standards for widths, and um, those sorts of things in regards to streets. Um, and staff under reviewing it found that, the, that this met those standards. And I think um, the council person brought up about including the street in the study. That, I don't know. I'm looking at you. I don't know if you remember that part of it or not. When she, I think she, if I recall, she was asking about the Metro Council's ability to oh, okay. accept this, basically, and uh, Lisa had answered that earlier. Okay. But if right. you have a specific question, well, I, to I thought it was actually cal the calculations with the new street that would be. Sure. I think there was a question in regards to um, the compatibility requirements being applied to lots one, two, and three. Um, and so the, the infill subdivision regulations kind of specific stay that for new lots in areas that are previously subdivided and predominantly developed in zoned R and RS for new lots resulting from a subdivision on an existing street and so a lot fronting on an existing street this lots one two and three are on essentially a new street and so we applied the compatibility requirements um, as is our standard to lot four where it fronts on the existing street well, it's that's 
you know, I'll, I'll listen to the rest of the, you know, commission, especially the ones that listened in and kind of see what your thoughts are now. But it's, it's just the whole cul-de-sac, but um, that I still have an issue with the breaking of the, of the rhythm of that, of Woodlawn. But um, I'll still be interested to kind of hear what others have thought about since our last conversation on it. Thank you. And actually, where did Lisa, Lisa's there? Um, I, I, can I just actually go a little out of order and ask a couple of questions since I was here and asked a lot of questions at the last hearing? Um, so I, in my understanding and in, in what the council lady was asking is because we're saying that access to lot four has to come off of this new road, are we basically saying that it's already, that that road exists to some degree? And I don't know if that's true. I mean, it's coming off the, the a driveway at this point, but because we're mandating that access has to come off this new road, I think that's where she was saying we, we were muddying the waters a little bit. The infill subdivision regulations, there is a, there is a, um, a separate section of those infill subdivision regulations that essentially allow for um, reasonable conditions to be placed. And so staff, in reviewing this, Woodlawn is a collector, and we often try to um, limit connections to those situations. And where we have this kind of new street, we said the access to Lot 4 should be limited to this new road the opportunity presented itself to kind of limit the access on a collector and so we included that and, and they um, agreed to that condition. And can I ask one other question because this has led me to read the subdivision regulations which I had not read in detail before. Um, but there was another section that addressed um, the street placement. And I understand that the whole thing taken together is supposed to talk about, you know, we've got the compatibility standards, but we still have these other conditions and requirements that we have to look at as well to um, look at the overall harmonious development of the neighborhood. So the section I was looking at um, was 3-9.4 B2, which said that all streets should be properly related to, and it went on through a list, but then it said the pattern of existing and proposed land uses. Um, and I think if you look at this whole area broadly, you can see that the proposed street does align with the existing street across, across Woodlawn, Lynn, Lynnbrook. But if you just look at the area where we're evaluating compatibility, which is those three lots, I would argue that that, that street is not necessarily um, properly related to the pattern of existing land uses. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts are based on that section. Sure. So I would say that, um, so the infill subdivision regulations speak broadly to subdivisions. Um, the compatibility in regards to the area and frontage is one kind of specific section of that infill. Um, and so those three lots, while those are the ones that we utilize for the compatibility, it's because that's specifically what the subdivisions regulations say that you have to look at for that specific math mathematical calculation of area and frontage. It also has the other standards about having to have frontage on a public street and, and those sorts of things. And so the reason that, um, that those were included is because the planning, the regulations essentially say for this specific mathematical calculation, you look at the five lots on either side. Mm -hmm. But, but you do have to take the subdivision regulations as a whole to determine whether it's harmonious or not. So there's a more specific analysis as it relates to the compatibility of the lot facing Woodlawn. But then we, we are reviewing the rest of the regulations for the, to make sure the whole subdivision meets all other parts of the regulations. So uh, I'm not sure we answered your question, but that is... I think I would say from what Lisa is noting here that we probably looked at a larger area to, to determine whether or not we met that point. You're asking if we considered a narrower area, this particular northern block face of Woodlawn, and I think the answer is we did not look at that. So we, we considered a broader area. I just think so, I mean, if we do look at it from that narrower, you know, the north side of Woodlawn being our area to determine compatibility, um, I would say that there's a question about whether or not this new street meets those, that requirement. Um, 
But so that's just something to think about, and I wanted to ask that since I was the one focused on the street at the last meeting and um, wanted that, to get that out there. That was me too. That that street. Uh, is it anything since it's um, since it is three lots? Does it bump up into a different subdivision since it's more than two lots now? Since it is three lots, uh, as far as being analyzed, or I mean, yes, yeah, four. But I guess, yeah. It, Does that? No, I'm sorry. So even if it was only two lots, the infill subdivision would, it, even if it was only creating two lots, the infill subdivision regulations would apply. So any subdivision of land that is in an area that's previously subdivided and predominantly developed on an existing street falls under the infill subdivision so regulations. So three, it doesn't matter. It gets up to be more or whatever. Right. I mean, if it's two to six along an existing street, it's all infill. Commissioner Michelle, I'll let you go. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot to add to what I learned at the last meeting. Um, I think I can see that what the neighbors wanted was that this, the, these two lots, the one that's not being considered today and the one that is being considered today would be merged and turned into three lots. But that isn't what the owners are doing, and what the owners are doing is in compliance. And if you look at the orientation of the new street, I mean, if they got, if the neighbors got what they wanted, there would be three lots and you would have three curb cuts. And what you're gonna have here is fewer than three curb cuts. And you're also gonna have the two houses that face Woodlawn are gonna be in character with the other houses on Woodlawn. So basically the only thing that's out of character is this little cul-de-sac, which is right opposite Lindbrook. To me, it's, you know, I, I said last time, I totally sympathize. They love the way it looks. It's beautiful. They wish it would stay that way, but it's not theirs and it's in compliance. And I think the only way they could get what they want would be to buy it and turn it into a green space. So I'm, I'm still inclined to approve this project. And Commissioner Gobble, can I have you go next? Sure. Uh, well, I'm kind of in the same boat. I think the uh, Council Lady Murphy did an excellent job of laying out her opposition. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, they, the fire marshal issue and being able to use this thing, I assume the fire marshal will, <clears throat> it will wind up complying with their regulations. Right, so they've approved it with the condition that um, the fire code issues will be addressed at, um, before this is recorded, which is, is pretty standard. Um, there are um, a standard set of requirements in regards to fire turnaround, uh, but this is consistent with one of the public works uh, standard street sections, so. Um, and um, there was a, the lot that's not being considered, that's already there approved, she mentioned uh, requiring that driveway, should it be built, access this through that close that's gonna be constructed. So that's an existing legal lot that is not included as a part of this subdivision, and so I don't think that you can include a condition on that because it's not a part of this subdivision. They could build a house today with an access onto Woodlawn because it is a legal um, building lot. But it makes all kinds of sense for it to attach to that close. So I, I understand why that can't be included, but can a condition be approved that says that that lot shall at least have the ability to do that versus, I guess it, since it's public street, they, they, they would have, have the frontage on that public street, so yeah, they would so be I guess able they would have the ability to do it. I'd hate to have that restricted. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of following along with Commissioner Bushell. I'm, I'm inclined to go along with it because I think it meets the regs. I'm not as bothered by this as some of the other commissioners on the combatability. As you drive down Woodlawn, you know, there's a, a big gap there in that section. And uh, I think having a road <coughs> that's, that's placed as they place this one uh, kind of fits in. So that's where I am. 
Um, Commissioner Moore, would you like to? So I don't really have many more comments than what has already been said. I think um, I think Vice Chair, especially at the last meeting, you raised some valid points, and those were some of the concerns that I had at the previous meeting, although this is a different proposal before us, and I do understand some of the basic needs are met here. Um, I still am really struggling, um, I guess, on the other side of you with, <laughs> with the, the cul-de-sac being added. Um, so that's kind of where I am right now. Commissioner Sims? <coughs> It's not quite the same when you listen on TV as being here, so I'm going to try to make sure that I understood correctly. Um, the point that I, I think that um, the developer is trying to get us to see is the legal process that we have to go through for subdivisions. And I really got that. I understood the logic there until we got to the part where the regs clearly say that we can put reasonable conditions on it. And I think if I understood when that was asked, you weren't willing to do that. <laughs> if that's, if I understood the TV. Somebody said, are you willing to put some height, height conditions on it? I don't know who needs to address it. We did that. object to it, but we're not raising that again. I mean, it's, it's there, it's on there, it will be part of this flat. Okay. Because I think the height, when you think about character in a neighborhood, it's both the style of the homes as well as the height, particularly the height of, the, uh, of it. And I do have a little bit of concern about whether or not you would consider a brand new cul-de-sac as anything other than a major compatibility issue. But my question was, can we address some of our other issues through placing conditions, particularly height and particularly style? And I'm not sure where that comes in, but I didn't want us to have to follow the rules all the way until we got to the conditions and say, oh, never mind, eliminate that one, because that is clearly a legal responsibility we have. I think the second thing I was really questioning is when you've got over 157 trees being cut down, and there was, I understand, according to one of the letters, a tree study done, and is this an environmental, at what point does it become an environmental issue, which is clearly part of the regs? So my understanding is that there has been a tree um, survey and, and the applicant could speak to that. Um, we would certainly look at and try to um, preserve as many trees as possible. Um, for single and two family zoning districts, generally um, that would be um, addressed with the zoning code, okay. not the subdivision regulation. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Commissioner Sims, if you have some questions of the applicant, we can ask them to come forward if that would help. Um, my main question was why were they objecting to the conditions? Okay. So that's the and then the other was okay. with the tree study. I don't know. I know you're saying that's under zoning, but at what point does that get understood by us what that might look like? So there are some general. So, so there are some standards in the zoning code in regards to development of single and <coughs> family lots. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, tree planting and tree density requirements. Um, we can look at the existing um, trees with a final plat when it came in, um, but there are standards in the zoning code. So extending much beyond what's in the zoning code could be difficult. Because when you look at the feedback from the people both on TV and the ones we got in writing, one of the major concerns was the tree canopy. And, <clears throat> and I think it's a, particularly because it is so close to downtown where we're losing so much of our canopy, I wasn't sure if that would be something we could put in our conditions or not. So I'm not sure if that's a question for them or be, a question for I mean, that's, is that... So can we speak to whether or not there's conditions we could add for tree preservation as part of a subdivision? Um, we do have the reasonable condition on height, so that is included, so that was one concern. I think, I think that if the standards for protecting trees is in the zoning code, that is something that would be administered down the road at the permit. And so I think that you can accomplish, that. that's the point in the process where you can accomplish okay. Okay. those goals. Okay. Um, okay. Is, unless staff disagrees, is there anything? Okay. I mean, th this is not a rezoning, this is a subdivision and it generally is about 
looking at the lot layout and the street locations and things like that, but. Um, well, it does say that we can I think we can, we will see a development plan with this and we always will work with the applicant to try to preserve as many trees as possible when we're looking at the, the final grading plans, but. I think Lisa is correct that the, the, the zoning code addresses those issues and how we would, uh, uh, what kind of tree replacement would be required per the zoning code. Well, according to the, I mean, there's TCA 13-4303 is that in considerate, considering the proposed subdivision, we should also consider the development pattern of the area, unique geographic, environmental factors, and other relevant information. And so this is part of what we have to consider during the subdivision. Well, the TCA outlines what your subdivision regulations can include, and I mean, that's something that I guess we can go back and look at and see if there's uh, amendments to our subdivision regulations that are necessary, but um, okay. to my knowledge, there's not anything in the subdivision regulations right. the, that speaks to that. The environmental things that our subdivision regulations include are for um, steep slopes, uh, critical lots, for um, uh, wetlands, for um, uh, sinkholes, uh, floodplain, those sorts of things. The um, rural subdivision regulations, not this part, but specifically the rural subdivision regulations, talks about the preservation of cedar glades. And so, but the infill subdivision regulations and the regular outside of the rural do not speak to tree preservation specifically. Okay. I guess I'm really searching for how we ground in policy the request for the community, which I take seriously, as you guys know, but also um, Councilwoman Murphy, who is well respected about her knowledge of this stuff. So when the neighborhood and the council person comes out against it, I want to make sure we've covered all our bases. Um, so that was my question. Commissioner Haynes. So I struggled with this. Um, in June of 1978, I drank beer in this backyard. <laughs> uh, so I know this property extremely well. Uh, I hope I don't have to accuse myself for having had a beer on this property. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the legacy lots in this area, including the Jarman property um, on the northwest corner of Bowling and Woodlawn, the property on the southeast corner of Bowling and Woodlawn, and then you've got the opposite corner, um, all of those folks could have introduced cul-de-sac roads to achieve subdivision. I, I don't like this concept of inserting a road and that lot four is compatible, but the other three are not because it's a new road. Um, I happen to agree with everything Council Lady Murphy said in her analysis, except for that the rate of return is something that we should consider that's not under our purview and, and Council Lady Murphy, I don't think it should be under yours. So the rate of return doesn't matter to me. So I, I struggle with this. Um, I, I drive by here all the time. Um, I'm inclined to vote against it. Okay. So anybody else have further questions or comments they'd like to share? Any other questions of staff before we just have to get a motion? Our ah. legal counsel wants to. Just before anyone makes a motion one way or the other, I want to remind the planning commission that this, you all are the final arbiter of subdivisions um, and concept plans. So you have a recommendation from planning stating that it does meet the subregs. State law requires that if you believe, if you agree with planning and, and find that it does meet the subregs, you, are, you don't have a basis not to approve it. Um, if you disagree with planning and find that it does not meet the subregs, then you need to sp state specifically how it does not meet the subregs, how it's different from planning's the staff's analysis, so that it's clear that you're not um, disapproving it in spite of meeting the subregs, but rather you're disapproving it because you think it does not meet the subregs for A, B, or C reason. And for, clar for clarification purposes, those reasons can include what, Council? Whatever, within the subdivision regulations that you think it doesn't meet, the analysis that you would give 
and you know how the planning that staff has what they've analyzed you know what within that an analysis or what within the subdivision regulations do you disagree with how do you think it doesn't meet what part of the subdivision regulations the compatibility requirements etc do you think it does not meet can they um, that three nine point four be read one more time that um, th I'm going to ask our executive director if she can read that since she's got it. Three, three 9.4 D2. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was reading. Is this under the section yes. that. Okay. Yes. So under street construction. Unless there's another, but. Under I'll street page, construction. Page 14. Um, right. Okay. Page 14 of the subdivision regulations under street construction and related requirements. Under section D, arrangement of streets, um, the item two says all streets shall be properly related to special traffic generators such as industries, business districts, schools, churches, and so shopping centers to population densities and to the pattern of existing and proposed land uses. So let me ask a question. If lots one, two, three, and four were currently one lot and the road were there, and they came in to subdivide the single lot with the cul-de-sac there, would this meet subdivision regulations? So I'm just clarifying. We haven't done the analysis, so I'm not going to give you an off-the-cuff. But I, so, um, if you can, so basically, you're saying if the if the cul-de-sac existed today, Correct. and lots one, two, and three were existing, and four, all were and four, and there was a proposal to subdivide four only. No, it was no. one lot. Subdivide the single lot into four lots. The single lot into four lots, then yes, we would need to um, review this against the compatibility requirements. And the subdivision regulations include standards that say which lot should be used, and it has to do with orientation and the like. But yes, and staff, do you have any? So if if one, two, three, and four were all one lot, and this cul-de-sac um, existed the way that it did. Um, the first thing that we would have to determine, probably in concert with the zoning administrator, would be what the orientation of that existing oddly shaped lot is um, in regards to if it would be considered to be oriented to the um, cul-de-sac or to Woodlawn. Um, because then we would have to, in order to determine compatibility, you have to know which way their um, existing lots are um, oriented. So if you were then creating three new lots on that cul-de-sac, you likely det uh, wouldn't have lots to compare it to. And there's a section of the subdivision regulations that essentially says if you have no lots to compare it to, then, the sub then you can look at a larger area. You may look at a larger area. And so it's really difficult to say because we would have to have the zoning administrator determine what is considered the front of such an oddly shaped lot. But to clarify, would we be using the compatibility requirements? Yes. 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 So we, we can't tell you if they would meet, but we can say we would apply those standards. Yes. Okay. Is there anybody who would like to make a motion? Anybody? Any further discussion? Yes. <laughs> you can make a yes, you could, the chair can make a motion. I can make I think. A motion. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, as the one who has been most troubled by the cul-de-sac street, um, I would make a motion for disapproval uh, based on on the incompatibility of that new street pursuant to this section of the subdivision regs, which looks specifically at whether or not the streets are properly related to the existing and proposed land uses. And I would argue that it, we need to look narrowly at that street face or that, that one block of woodlawn that runs from Bowling to Wilson on the north north side of that to determine that. Second. Just, just one clarification. You are saying 3-9 point, that particular one. Yeah. Okay.
Discussion? <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. Just to, just to clarify the, the motion, so if you vote, your, your motion is to disapprove. My motion is to disapprove, yes. So, okay. It's and can I clarify too, just for the record, the, the, you identified the section of Wilson to bowling because on the north side. Because that's the, the stretch, you know, the block face that we're looking at. Okay. Um, I mean, I was originally going to just say the three lots that we looked at for compatibility purposes, you know, from, from the proposed lot mm -hmm. to bowling, since that's what we use for our compatibility analysis. But to your point, we look a little bit more broadly mm -hmm. than that. Call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. show of hands. The, the motion. Yes, you're, you're pushing me. Um, I am. I have made a motion to disapprove the sub the subdivision the proposal because uh, I do not feel that the introduction of the cul-de-sac is compatible. Um, and it doesn't meet the, re the requirements for streets, that they are properly placed related to existing and proposed land uses if we look at that block of woodlawn, the northern side of that block of woodlawn. Does that help? Okay, so we have, a, by show of hands, let's get our show of hands again. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, all opposed? All right, well, motion carries five to two. All right, we have one more item tonight. Anybody need a bathroom break before we get through our last item? Now we'll just keep on going. Item 16A. The following presentation consists of two items, item 16A and 16B. Both items will be presented together. However, each item must be voted on separately. Item 16A is a request for a SP to permit up to 12,750 square feet of non-residential uses and 239 multifamily residential units. Item 16B is a request to cancel an existing plan unit development overlay district. For item 16A, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. For item 16B, staff recommendation is to approve if the associated zone change is approved and disapprove if the associated zone change is not approved. The site is located approximately 500 feet south of Young's Lane near the intersection of Buena Vista Pike and West Trinity Lane in the Bordeaux-Whites Creek Haynes Trinity Community Plan area. The site of the SP is currently vacant and is outlined in yellow. The site of the PUD has an existing single family house but consists mostly of vacant land and is outlined in blue. Nearby uses include multifamily residential, single family residential, two family residential, and vacant land. The site is located in the one and two family residential R8 zoning district. This site is also located in an existing residential plan unit development that permits up to 124 multifamily residential units. The current image on the screen 
is of the approved plan unit development that permits up to 124 multifamily residential units. Metro Council approved the existing residential plan unit development in 1985 to allow up to 124 multifamily residential units on the property. In 1996, the Metro Planning Commission approved a revision to the preliminary PUD plan and a final plan for grading only. The approved revision in 1996 maintained 124 multifamily residential units. To date, no development has taken place. The site is located in the conservation and T4 urban mixed-use corridor policy areas. A small portion of the SP site is in the T4 urban neighborhood center policy area. Conservation policy is intended to preserve environmentally sensitive land features through protection and remediation. The T4 urban mixed-use corridor policy is intended to enhance urban mixed-use corridors by encouraging a greater mix of higher density residential and mixed-use development along the corridor. This site is located in a supplemental policy area that identifies mobility and greenway connections to the Cumberland River as vital components. The SP proposal includes 239 multifamily residential units and 12,750 square feet of non-residential uses. The plan provides for new public streets, associated parking, an amenity area in the form of a pool and a walking trail along the public greenway. The site is accessed from a new north-south public street that intersects with Buena Vista Pike. A new east-west public street runs through the center of the site and stubs to adjacent parcels. Both new public streets include sidewalk improvements consistent with local standards. The plan provides sidewalk improvements along site frontage on Buena Vista Pike consistent with the major collective street plan standards. Multifamily residential units orient to public streets and or open space. Non-residential uses orient to Buena Vista Pike. Private drives function as alleys for multifamily residential units with associated surface parking. The SP achieves several policy goals, including street and pedestrian connectivity, the Greenway Trail, and a mix of uses. This SP, in conjunction with the cancellation of the existing plan unit development, is consistent with the T4 Urban Mixed Use Corridor, T4 Urban Neighborhood Center Policy Areas, and the Haynes Trinity Supplemental Policy at this location. Given the aforementioned staff recommendation for item 16A is to approve the conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Staff recommendation for item 16B is to approve if the associated zone change is approved and disapprove if the associated zone change is not approved. As a reminder for the Planning Commission, item 16A and 16B must be voted on separately. Got it, thank you. So you, but you presented both, right? We now have a set of separate. Correct. <laughs> okay. 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 So we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Is the applicant here? And as a reminder, you'll have 10 minutes. Please state your name and address, and you can hold two minutes for a rebuttal. All right. It's Evan Holiday. I'm with LDG Development. Uh, so thank you for having us this evening. Uh, we were originally on the consent agenda, uh, but just in talking with, and you know, we've been working with the community to get to this point over the last two and a half years on this development, um, but Ms. George in the audience who I talked with earlier, uh, she just asked that it be taken off so that she can voice publicly on the record her support. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to yield the floor to her. Okay, well, let's uh, go through our process and then um, that's what we'll do. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So do we have anyone here speaking in support of the project? Please come forward. And if you state your name and address, you have two minutes. My name is Joyce George. I live at 711, <clears throat> excuse me, Work Drive. I've lived in the area for 51 years. When this project was originally um, given to us, we rejected it. We didn't like it. And uh, after communication broke off. We didn't know how, where it was going. But fortunately, a communication did resume, and we were able to have a community meeting and to make suggestions to this project. 
And as uh, through this effort, uh, our suggestions were incorporated into the plans. So the Haynes Trinity uh, Neighborhood Coalition is in support of this, and uh, we just want to make that known and in the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's always good to hear when projects in the community work well together. Uh, do we have anyone else speaking in support? Anyone speaking in opposition? Okay. Do you have anything else that you would like to? Okay. Well, then we'll declare the public hearing closed. Can I make a motion since this was on consent and she's in favor of it, we have no opposition, that we move it back to consent, both items 16A and 16B? Do we need to move it back to consent, or should we just, just vote just on each one? You just point. vote on it. Okay. You can make a yeah. motion of would you like to, to approve. Make them I would move approval of item 16A. Second. Yeah. Discussion. One second. Yeah. Ms. George, I want to thank you. For as long as I've known you, you have cared for your community. And I believe with all my heart when your coalition says that you're in favor of it, that that says a lot both about the coalition as well as you as developers. Our job would be so much easier if people like you took two and a half years to work with the community. So I just want to thank you publicly. Thank you. All right. So we uh, motion and second to approve a, a vote. Staff recommendation is approved with conditions. So you're approving yes. staff recommendation. Yes, we're approving staff's recommendation with conditions on item 16A. Correct. All in favor? Aye. All right. And then the subsequent item, 16B? Makes approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. So we have uh, approved 16B, which is the cancellation of the PUD. Um, and that concludes our items. I think we are now on to, I forget the order of our reports. You want to go first? Sure. Um, you will see before you the calendar 2019, Lisa's holding it up, uh, MPC schedule. And um, we uh, are asking that you look at the calendar. And it's a proposed calendar. We do need to approve it or adopt it at the first meeting in October. I do want to ask y'all to particularly look at the July and August dates. Um, we have really had some quorum concerns, and I think that for this year, and so I think it would be helpful to us to know early on if you have conflicts, and I understand that it may be difficult, we're seven months out, but if you already know you're, you're going on vacation in July and August, it helps. Um, we have removed, in an effort to work with your schedules, we have removed one meeting in July, um, sort of in and around the July 4th. Um, meeting date. We, we found that didn't actually totally help this year. So we're, we're open to, to working it out, but one thing, and Lisa can speak to this more, with the council schedule, it is really vital that we have a quorum the second meeting in July, um, if you can kind of explain what that's about. Sure. So um, next year will be a um, council election. And we have found past trends have been that that meeting in particular, when council members may be ending their terms and wanting to finish up business, that that meeting in particular can be um, a bit heavy. And so uh, not having a quorum or be able, being able to, to take care of business on that meeting can cause issues with the next step in the process at council. So we would just say we appreciate all of your service. We know that this takes a lot of time, and I'm really reluctant to to do anything not to support you having family time or whatever hiking time whatever it is um, but we do we do ask you to look at this and just let us know if you already know that there's going to be a conflict and we will we can look at the schedule within the bounds that we can I, I will um, say probably bring this up one more time maybe in May April May just so we can you know yes Okay, so we'll bring it back in the first meeting of October, but you now have the draft, so you can take a look, and we'll vote on it at that point. It can be amended um, later on, so thank you. Anything else? All right, historic? 
Yes. Or do you have something else? Something I know else? I do, do a okay. story. Um, so historic uh, was able to get approved an uh, economic impact study for historic preservation. Um, basically, this is something that uh, all historic um, preservation in the metropolitan will be reviewed, so the impact, so the, and we always hear about the true economic impact where they actually have commissioned a study. Um, so um, in February, that's supposed to be completed, so this will be helpful for historical Commission when uh, they're always concerned about how is their overlay. This is studying all the overlay districts and everything, and so they'll know how it really impacts and not just old data. So this is a, a, a big, um, uh, big, big move for historic commission that they're excited about. Great, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Uh, if possible, will they put that into something that's presentable and digestible? Um, I don't know about the adjustable part, but they will be able to, uh, it, it, they'll, when they're done with the study, well, first it will be presented prob probably at the Historic Commission. I don't know if it'll have a council, but that would be awesome if it did. And then it'll be something that will be presented around, and then it'll be, um, you know, um, memorialized probably on their website or somewhere. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and I, I just think that a lot of these studies, particularly, you know, my forte is not economics, uh, and it's good to have something presented to a group like this and to the council and others that's, you know, a five, ten minute presentation. So we, you know, if you give me a 400 page study, I have great intentions and little follow through. <laughs> and uh, so I may get through the executive summary, but sometimes on those, that's still 20 pages. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to see if it's possible, you know, that y'all think about. Well, I think it'll come in handy, and maybe, Lucy, if you, I don't know if you know enough about it to even chime in, but I think it'll come in like with Edge Hill, when it, something like Edge Hill comes up again, they will really be able to pull out um, data from the study, and or, you know, obviously not. Uh, another edge hill whenever it comes out so true data can be and so when people say well my property ta you know well there'll be data to either support or un not support so it, it'll be helpful for the case by case kind of things as much as it is the big presentation matter of fact I, I don't want to belabor this but it probably be more for the case by case really because we'll hear the big general thing we're like okay basically it does but this will the way I understand it will be able to say no this area was negatively impacted necessarily but but we've had in the past presentations from MDHA or um, from the walk bike folks. I mean, we've done sort of short presentations at the start of a commission meeting sometimes yeah. about studies or plans. And so maybe if, if it, you know, yeah. defer to you as our representative, but if that seems useful, that would be something we could consider. It sounds like it'd be very useful, so. It's uh, a great idea, just let me know when. Yeah, well, I'm, when it's, it's supposed to be done in February. Okay. So once it's done, we'll um, talk to historic <laughs> staff and just get them to present it, or they're, they're, um, they're actually using an outside source that does this nationally, so even maybe that person. Park? I just want to go on record that I was told that the Parks appointment would be an easy one. <laughs> it has not been easy. Uh, we have just heard the um, Edge Hill neighborhood and Belmont Park case. We've resolved the batting cage. We've been discussing that for months. <laughs> so we are debating very important things relative to our parks. Thank you for your service. We appreciate it very much. I do not think that we have anything on the executive committee, although with our chairman out, maybe he, I missed something, but. Just, you're the executive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> to, as of right now. So I will declare our meeting adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.net.